and welcome to SEC Sports Roundtable. This is your host, Shane Bailey, back in the seat for another two-a-day episode. We're going to have uh, each team from the SEC uh, looked at over these last three weeks and the next four weeks to cover the seven weeks prior, all that crazy math there, prior to the uh, start off of the regular season that's going to happen Thursday, August 30th, 29th? Yeah. I think it's the thirtieth. Uh, I just know it's Thursday. Yeah, you know that last Thursday in in August is all I can remember. Um, so we're we're just right at uh, it's the 29th now. So we might be thirty days out uh, from yeah. from kickoff uh, of the college football season. So it's fast fast approaching here. So thank you guys for listening into the SEC Sports Roundtable. Uh, that person that was joining me, if you're not watching this on video, is Blair Smiley. Welcome, Blair. It's good to be back. We're glad to have you. You seem loud all of a sudden. Imagine Sorry. that. No, it's how you, it's just you. I know it. I should be prepared by now <laughs> as many times as you've been on. Uh, so thanks for uh, joining us here. Uh, we are going to get the housekeeping out of the way early as we're trying to become accustomed to. So if you're stumbled upon this, thank you for listening. Uh, if you are a uh, loyal listener, we thank you again. I know that uh, Big Vol Daddy, if you're out there listening, you, you catch us on YouTube quite a bit. He wanted to, to know how to get this audio version. So uh, we are on iTunes. Uh, if you just do a search for SEC Sports, we're way up there at the top. Uh, a little radio uh, is our current mod, our current logo, so you can look for that uh, and, and subscribe there. If you don't have an iPhone or an Apple device, we're on Stitcher Radio. Uh, so if you have another smartphone carrier, you can pick pick us up on that app or any type of RSS feed if you just look for SEC Sports Roundtable. Um, that's the easiest way to get the audio version of the podcast. For video, like I mentioned earlier, uh, Big Val Daddy watches this on YouTube, so we, we do broadcast this on YouTube every week, uh, as well as we're doing Ustream now. So generally 1 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. That's 1 o'clock Central Time is when we try to record this. So that's the, the easiest time to, to catch us out on Ustream. If you want to watch this live, uh, feel free to do that. Uh, we encourage anyone that wants to join the conversation to do that. And right now, the easiest way to communicate with us is via our Facebook page or our Twitter, both at SCCSRT or on the website, sccsportsroundtable.com. So lots of ways to join the conversation, to listen to the podcast, to view the podcast and be part of this. So a uh, couple of blog posts I've put up in the last week or so, you know, the schedule was released, and we'll, I guess, go right into things. Um, and that's, we were talking, you know, b- pre-record here some things, and that's something we can kind of look at, look at was that uh, the fir- the TV times were announced. Yes. Um, you know, for in first three weeks, which it's nice to see three weeks out. Uh, you know, I wish the, I know that they do it two weeks out once the season gets kicked off, but it'd be nice to have that three weeks as far as preparation goes. Um, you know, especially when you're adding two extra teams or just more logistics that ends up going into things, uh, that extra week would be nice if they could keep that going. But I don't see, uh, I don't see the SEC yeah. doing that. So, but uh, the first three weeks are out, so we can look at that. But I've got a, a couple of blog posts up on the website that uh, basically talk about some of the best games to watch because it is uh, early in the season, and and so you you've got some of those teams where the matchups aren't generally the best, but. Uh, you know, if you look at that, and I'll, I'll pull that up if you want to talk for a second, but, uh, you know, surprising a lot. There's a number of good yeah. matchups. Well, you know, the the opening weekend, you know, you've got now the double Chick-fil-A game on Friday and Saturday yeah. night, and then you've got, uh, you and that, know. That's the, f- the first one is going to be Vandy, South Carolina. Right? Yeah, that's going to be Thursday night, so that's awesome. Uh, and that's going to be here at Vanderbilt, which um, – just a side note, Vanderbilt's, I think, within 5,000 of actually selling out season tickets. So, I mean, they're just – James Franklin is doing an unbelievable job there. So I, I, We're going all over the place here, but, but that, that's uh, – you know, that's pretty funny. I was looking at uh, a post, and it, this comes from courtesy of the Birmingham News. But, uh, you know, there's a reason why they're only 5,000 away from selling oh out. Oh, really? Yeah, last year's season ticket prices, 2011, they averaged $31.43 a ticket. 2008 was $29.17. This year's season tickets, take a guess. You would think it would be more. Vanderbilt's $21. What? That's pretty smart, though. They want, they want you yeah. know, butts in the seats. Yeah, and because you don't need to pay. I mean, yeah, that, that's the whole problem. You, know, you charge $50, $60 for the Tennessee game when they come in or something crazy like that. So, 
Um, but, yeah, I mean, you start out with Vandy in South Carolina, which I think is going to be a good game. Yes. Um, and then you've got Tennessee on uh, and NC State on Friday night. And then you've got Auburn and Clemson that's going to be right back there in the Georgia on the next day. Um, and so you start off that weekend. So you always got that Labor Day where you've got some pretty good games. So um, it's typically not – um, You've got yeah, three of the four that I right. highlighted for week one. And then, you know, the way that the SEC had to kind of jumble everything around, you know, there's a lot of teams that play, you know, all, you know, Ole Miss plays all four of their non conference the very first four of the season. Um, but, you know, I think September 8th, you know, Auburn and Mississippi State actually start off at like 11 a.m. on ESPN. Yeah. It's, I think, an ESPN triple header, if I'm not mistaken. I think. Was it Georgia and Missouri? Are you talking I, about week two? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the the other we'll we'll stay with week one. Here. Oh, you got week one. All right, you got it pulled up. Yeah, I've got it pulled up. You 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 picked. I picked four games week one that were of, of importance to watch as far as your schedule and making time for it. Uh, and the other one is Alabama Michigan. Oh yeah, that's right. So, I mean, big game. That's a huge game. I that's mean, the biggest one. That's like Georgia Boise State last year. Yeah. I mean, as far as the early season hype. Or LSU or, uh, Oregon. Yeah, exa- yeah. Th- I guess that's more because yeah. Michigan can actually compete They're for the be national good. championship. Yeah. So you're right. It is more like the uh, LSU Oregon game from last year. Is that game in the Dallas? Is that the Dallas? Yeah, it's game? the Jerry. Yeah, the Cowboy kickoff. Right, That'd be a good game. Eight o'clock uh, Eastern time on September first. Yeah. ABC probably. Yeah. Uh, yes, you, you're exactly right. So. You know that it's Thursday, August first. Now that I've got this pulled up, um, is the uh, kickoff for Vanderbilt. So it's the thirty first, not the twenty. Thirty first. Or it's okay. the it's the first, not the. Oh first. yeah. Okay. So August first, since we. Or August or September first. Yeah. <laughs> there is a typo in my. Uh, <laughs> you know, my editor is not real good to understand <laughs> how soon football starts, so I'm gonna have to get on her. But I understand. No, so uh, yes, that will that does need to get changed. So uh, that's funny. Uh, glad we caught that. But anyway, so that's week one. Week two, you're right though. There are some other big matchups, and and uh, I'll pull that up. But you were you were hitting on them right there. Yeah, I think I know I know State and um, and Auburn's 11 a.m. because I'm going to be at that game. So I'm really thrilled about being in a bowling heater of a stadium for three hours and right in the the middle of the day. But uh, I think. If I'm not mistaken, it and um, the well, I'm trying to remember on the eighth. That should be the weekend that Florida travels to Texas A&M yep. and and Georgia goes to Missouri, right? Isn't that the the two like you got three of the four again? Okay, and then LSU plays somebody, Washington. Right, right. there you yeah. go. So nailing them. But uh, yeah, so I mean, I like that. That's going to be a big weekend for those new teams to have their first home stadiums. That, you know, Both of those are home big games, games for yeah. Missouri and – Great, great job by the SEC on scheduling that type of stuff. Yeah. But, and, and but it's kind of a little bit different you're talking about this because the SEC, they had to kind of kind of makeshift the schedules this year. You know, a lot of people had to move things around. You know, South Carolina's not playing Georgia the second week. They're playing them the sixth week. And, you know, and, we're, and, we're normally – and, and after, we're normally Auburn, LSU, and then somebody else tough in the first four weeks. And, and we Spurrier don't have wished they had that with the suspensions Georgia has. You exactly. know, he, he made right. a comment about it. And, but uh, yeah, I'm looking forward. to that. That's going to be a big day. And and I was when I did this blog post, I was all re- I looked at the I didn't see the times, and I was all ready to get up on a soapbox because last year it never failed for me. Every time I wanted to watch some good games, there were like three, three games sandwiched yeah. on top of one another. But you know the way this schedule works out. And you know, in the in the post, I said eleven of the fourteen teams are in action against each other. Um, let me see what I said there, but it, they've they've did a great job spacing this. So out. So when are they playing? So the triple header at ESPN is going to be State Auburn. Then who's playing next? Well, there's eleven different games. Oh, okay. That that second week. Um, pl- so the fourteen teams are playing eleven games. So gotcha. there's a lot of matchups with. Yeah. Uh, so you you think about scheduling that, yeah. and and as far as you know, the good news is there's a lot of cupcakes in there. Right. But you, you you're starting off like you said, you guys kick off at like 11, and then you've got uh, Texas A&M and Florida. They kick off at 3:30. Uh, is that ESPN? Yeah. Okay. And then um, LSU and Washington are at seven, seven. and then. Um, so Missouri Georgia's the CBS game. No, it's SEC too. Um, 
You know, that CBS doesn't start that week, right? Yeah, they're, they're on ESPN, too. So there is some overlap, but it's it's kickoff at 745. Okay. So they gave a 45-minute differential. So you're able to yeah. you know take advantage of that halftime, so to speak. So you're able to have okay. full action from 7 to about 11 o'clock. I always forget that CBS doesn't start till like, the third week of the season, which yeah. is kind of strange. And so, you know, as far as the scheduling goes for that week, too, they did a great job with some of those matchups. In the first two weeks, you've got some exciting football. Yeah. Because, you know, it didn't used to be the case that, you, right. you know, like you said, uh, Ole Miss has four. They're non-conference. Yeah. A lot of times you had your – two or the first two weeks you were yeah. playing those non-conference games except for maybe one or two games that were worth watching. And then the now is the third week that right. we've already got times. That's the, the first time that CBS has not covered the Florida-Tennessee game. If I remember right, I think they're going with Alabama-Arkansas. Um so I think that is the fifteenth, if I'm not mistaken. You're gonna have to. I'm gonna uh, have to pull that up. I don't have my week three blog up yet. But uh, yeah. but I think that's I think that's right because it, they made a big deal that since CBS has been doing the CBS game, um, it is the first time that the Florida Tennessee series on that Saturday isn't the CBS game. So I'm it kind of tells you where Florida and Tennessee are when it comes to the, you know that Auburn. I mean that and how far Alabama and the Arkansas series has come. Here we go. I've got. I'm pulling up now. Week three. There were there were four games there worth watching. Uh, Alabama at Arkansas. That's the CBS game. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a, a 3:30 Eastern time kickoff. Uh, really, Texas A&M and SMU is a big game. Yeah. For us yeah. non, for not being involved with those teams, but that's yeah, a big June game. Jones, man, yeah. That's, but that's a big game for A&M as far as staying in the state of Texas. Florida at Tennessee is on ESPN at 6 o'clock. And then Ole Miss, Texas. Um, you got Arizona State at Mar- Missouri, which is a pretty good matchup. It is. Um, then you go down to Texas at Ole Miss yeah. is the other one. So, And that's a 9-15 Eastern time start. Yeah. So that's a really – It'll be li- nice and really liquored up at Ole Miss to just get completely trounced. Yes. I mean, it's not <laughs> even going to be funny. <laughs> so it's uh, – but it'll be a good crowd. It'll be a good atmosphere, you know, because uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure Ole Miss – I mean, that's the game that everybody's going to be at and come to. So you don't have Texas come to your place very often. And you like seeing that. I mean, that's an eight fifteen kickoff yeah. here. Uh, Central time, but you like seeing that extra game oh, at yeah. eight fifteen, eight thirty as a kickoff because you it, prime time, man. You know, it's Saturday night. You're out hanging out at a bar or something, watching games. It, it it's really not a good feeling for those games to be over at ten. Yeah, o'clock. I'll tune in to watch that one. Don't so, worry. Uh, but uh, you see know, see our the, old guy Manny Diaz and see what he does with Texas. Could get ugly real quick. Uh, I don't think they'll be afraid to have run up the score. Yeah. Max never been afraid to do that when he's given Especially the Especially after the last two years. Yes. They're going to do whatever they want to do. He's If he's got a chance to win, he's going to prove that, that, that they've got a seat at the table and be, belong in any conversation about good teams down there in Texas. So, uh, you know, it's a it's a good first three weeks of it football is. as far as the, the timing and the scheduling goes. Uh, let's see what happens the next, uh, what, 13, 10 weeks. Yeah. Of scheduling, so uh, it's going to be, be fun. It's going to be fun. Uh, other news this week, though, there's been a couple of uh, incidents, or at least an incident, uh, occurring in the state that we record this podcast in. <laughs> um, you know, Dooley was on his, was it the caravan tour? Is that what they call it? The volunteer? Yeah, it's where they have the big barbecue thing here in Nashville. Nashville yeah. yeah, but they, they hit big cities across yeah. the state trying to just drum up excitement and uh you know, he had some a couple of comments about that this week, and if you're not familiar with what we're talking about, uh, their star sophomore, or is he junior now? He's junior. Junior. Quarter, that's right. He hurt, got hurt the yeah. sophomore. Uh, junior quarterback Tyler Bray was uh, practicing his, his throwing, um, you know, and Dooley made a comment that he needs to work on his accuracy because he's uh, not able to find the trash can, but uh, hurling beer bottles at – parked cars in his apartment complex so little excitement down there in vol land yeah didn't he do it twice too didn't the girl supposedly and i didn't really follow this very much and i was out of town but somebody was telling me that um the story was that they threw and cracked a girl's windshield and the girl got to her car and there's a note that said i know who did this and basically was ratted out, and so the next day her car was windshield was windshield busted. broken. So that's just family. But at the time that that was supposedly occurred, 
Bray was in team uh, meetings. Okay. So so he wasn't the one. He wasn't directly involved. <laughs> you with know, the second one? With the yeah. second one, yeah. He was directly involved with the throwing in the first one, I think. Uh, you know, when he comes out to offer to pay to, to fix the damages, uh, you know he was the one that was involved with that. And, and people are right. Um, you know, if this was just some normal college kid doing this, this would be a non-story. Right. Uh, but, you know, it's the Tennessee Volunteers. They're supposed to be having a comeback year. Uh, you know, this is a, a year that they've got a lot to prove, and their leader and their star is acting like a junior in college. Yeah. And, and whether you're a junior in college or not, when you play football in the SEC, you can't do that. I mean, Kentucky, we, we experienced a bowl loss because of our quarterback's stupidity yeah. with alcohol, uh, you know, two yeah. years ago. We lost that ball game yeah. um, over over alcohol and a, and a fist fight. So. Yeah, it's just it's not very smart. No. And, and with all the eyes on him and how the season ended and basically not being really invested in the Kentucky game and, you know, the the, the split on the team between the veterans and the, the young guys and – and, you know, his spring performance last year and, you know, whether he could just kind of got it type of deal. And, you know, he was kind of on that stepping stool of the maturation process that they want to see. And then you have another incident like this. It's just, you know, it's just one of those things you don't want to see because, unfortunately, for Tennessee fans, they Depends got a lot on who riding. You ask. Yeah, I mean, you got a lot riding on it. And, and you you need to start off the season well uh, for the psyche of the football team. And um, Dooley's seat is, you know, fiery hot. Um, so it's just one of those deals where, you know, it's is it a big deal? No, not really. But, I mean, I was a junior in college, but it never really occurred to me that I ought to throw a beer bottle and break somebody's windshield. Oh, well, I not mean, in the middle of the afternoon. Yeah. And so, I mean, yeah, I guess 3 a.m. it's better time well, <laughs> to I mean, come up with it. You would expect to be at, at that level of intoxication at 3 in the morning, yeah. that that you lose those inhibitions and yeah. start doing stupid things. You know, middle of the day, right before the season practices are getting ready to start, yeah. probably not yeah. the best decision. That throws up a red flag, so we'll we'll see what it leads to. Yeah, it's uh, it, it, it does. It just shows the maturity level that we're looking at right here and. And we've all done stupid things in college. So I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not guilty of doing stupid things in college. I am I have. But the thing is, he's the leader or, or is looked at to be the leader of the team. Your quarterback yeah. is, is, in most situations, your captain, the guy that you look to to, to lead your team and be the, the the voice of reason, so to speak. And yeah. and it just makes it. And it, we're not we're not 19. Right, mid mid nineteen eighties, and we're not Jim McMahon at BYU. Yeah, you know this is Tyler Bray. Where you can do it, nobody knows about it, and yeah. and, and he doesn't care because he's not going to get kicked off the team. Yeah, you know it's a different time, so yeah, it's just it's newsworthy because there's nothing else yeah. to talk about. Exactly, and so we're we're kudos to UT for making headlines. Yeah, um, I enjoyed it. I, I can't tell you I wasn't sad about hearing those things. Any other news that you want that you know of? I think uh, the only other thing that popped in was those um, the Arkansas players. Oh yes, um, that were three <laughs> arrested for the burglary or whatever they decided more, to do. More stupidity in the SEC. Yeah. They, uh, I guess, it came out this week that they were not going to be a part of the team uh, or play at all this fall. So it's a big, big loss on the, the receiver. You know, not only do you lose the three studs from last year, but you lose two of your top four returners and uh really one of them was your punt returner and um i forget the name markel wade yeah markel wade and then and there's Madrakis Humphrey. Humphreys, or i may have them yeah. backwards but um they were both i mean they both played a lot last year um so they were gonna kind of help um kind of keep that that steam engine rolling there in that offense and them not being on there just because a really stupid mistake yeah and and you know it's it's not your first string wide receivers, but you know when when you're a second string wide receiver in the SEC, you're still going to get your fair oh, share yeah. of touches. And uh, you know you got a Heisman candidate in Tyler Wilson, so you know the ball is going to be able to be thrown to you and thrown to you often in that offense, because it's all indications John L. Smith's not going to change up a lot of things yeah. over there in Arkansas. So other that, than he's going to be more personable than than uh, Petrino. <laughs> 
Well, it depends on personable. Yeah. I mean, he was personable with 25-year-old yeah. interns. Well, that's him. true. <laughs> Got a point there. Uh, but uh, but he is, John L. is going to run a tighter ship. Yeah. I mean, it's evident here. You know, he basically said the, the way he indicated that they're not on the team is, you know, if they're not on the uh, official press guide, you know, they're not going to be on the team. And, yeah. you know, those names were – blaringly off of that oh, list yeah. so uh you know it doesn't mean they might not be on the team next year or, or some other point down the road but right now they're not on the team so hey that's good i mean you you understand that you sh- you've got to run a tight ship and when you have a football program like that yeah uh, especially with the issues that arkansas had with their coaches you know there's there's no gray area here if you do something wrong you've got to have a coach yeah. that's going to be out there to especially when you're going into someone's dorm or something i can't remember what yeah. it was into a dorm room yeah computers yeah you know pretty pretty easy to figure that yeah. one out uh, when you're stealing from your fellow students it's kind of hard to put you back in the student body so as, as you said it wasn't you know cam newton res- buying a stolen laptop and and trying yeah. to hide the evidence yeah. you know they they were the ones taking yeah. the evidence exactly <laughs> so uh all right well we'll get on with some things we'll there's one other piece of news, and we'll, that'll lead us straight into our, our two-a-days discussion here. Uh, and like I said, we've covered Auburn and uh, Georgia. Georgia the first week. So if you, you're looking for your team, um, here's who we've done so far. Week one was Auburn-Georgia. Uh, week two, we did Arkansas and Missouri. Uh, then last week, we covered Ole Miss and Vanderbilt. Uh, and this week, we're con- covering Kentucky and Mississippi State. So definitely the reason why we have uh, – Blair here, and, and I'm here by default. So, uh, <laughs> you just have a big, good, uh, big blue guy. I, yeah, I just happen to support the the, the big blue nation over here. Uh, but uh, you know what what was in the news this week was some news from Mississippi State, and uh, you know you're all are all about getting these fancy uniforms. And you know, you know it's kind of funny. We actually this is the first time we've changed our uniform in three years. We we Aside did the specialty th- uniform But last y'all make year. A, made a big deal about the yeah. Egg Bowl last year, yeah. those Egg Bowl uniforms. And so they, they wanted to kind of change them up. So, um, and I like them. And, and if most people have actually kind of paid attention, Texas A&M had their unveiling about two weeks ago. And when you're maroon and gray and white, like we are, we're both Adidas schools. So there's some – tweaks here and there but we do have kind of similar looks um but um i like them we just displayed our new away and um uh, home logo or home uniforms and the one thing they added was um normally it's white pants maroon top and uh and vice versa um for the road but now they've actually got um some gray pants that are added in there uh with the maroon top so it's uh it's pretty good. I mean, they've got uh, just a couple of tweaks here and there. The Mississippi State logo is going to be a little bit bigger on the front, and they've actually, um, in I guess, uh, put in the banner that's on the M State logo. Um, so they've done a big wide stripe down the middle of the the helmet and some other stuff. But uh, I liked it. I mean, it's it's uh, it's kind of a different deal, and it's just kind of the way things are going now. That uh, um, you know when you're dealing with recruits and you want to keep things fresh and and new and you know you're not an Alabama or a Penn State for heaven's sakes that's got the old school jersey that's more tradition laced um you know you can kind of change it up and tweak it every every few bits to kind of keep it going so but uh, looks like they're going to have a Texas A&M special jersey that's going to be kind of referenced toward the snow bowl that we played last time we played them in 2000 in Shreveport. Which Aren't there was some rumors about some special things that might go on? Um, oh, about the snow machine? That yeah. was kind of funny. Wasn't it? Um, essentially what we're – if anybody doesn't know anything about the snow bowl, it's when Jackie Sherrill was there and we played Texas A&M, and so Texas A&M played in all maroon, maroon hat, pants, and shirt, and state went for the first time ever all white with white helmet, white – shirt and white pants and it snowed like six inches and <laughs> became this disaster of a game um and we ended up winning it um and for some reason it's like the third most watched espn bowl game ever in their history on espn you know because espn just recently i think just recently started getting like the bigger 
BCS stuff, if I don't, if I remember correctly. So all the stuff they had was more of the lower tiered stuff right. anyway. Um, but it was kind of funny. But uh, supposedly we're going to roll out with some white hats and white pants and white shirts, and supposedly maybe possibly gray numbers is the rumor out there. So, but uh, but our AD did go on Twitter and say that they looked into getting a snow machine to instead of the fog to come out with and. It at the temperature average temperature at that time it would only mist in the <laughs> south. So uh, he asked for any uh, any uh, help on Twitter if anybody knew how to do that, which I thought was kind of interesting. Thanks. And we'll have another egg bowl uh, jersey j- jersey of some type. So that's uh, and, be and interesting. You brought up a very good point, though. It's it's nice for you with with the similarity in color and scheme with A and M to both be Adidas programs. Yeah. Uh, so they know ahead of time. Uh, yeah. As well, so they can make sure that there's some enough differences that when you're watching a, a game from afar, you can easily distinguish yeah. between the two programs. Uh, yeah, so, it's going to be interesting. So, you know, w- that leads us talking into Mississippi State. You know, uh, as we as we cover this, uh, I'll be remiss to say that uh, my knowledge of Mississippi State is less than par. Uh, I've done. It's I've like most. Well. Uh, here's my thought, my reasoning behind it. I've done research on all the other teams before beforehand, but you are such a wealth of knowledge when it comes <laughs> to Mississippi State that you can rattle off stuff without looking at a magazine or a notebook. And you're given records they had from six years ago and their scores, and it's like, all right, he's got Mississippi State covered. He, I could yeah. just say go and then turn turn away. I could actually walk away for 30 minutes, and you, you'd, you'd barely caught – Stop to catch a breath to do this Mississippi Yeah, we could State. go as long as you wanted to. You know? There, there I mean, we go, exactly. You could do the same thing on Kentucky probably. Probably not. Okay. Well, it, we're, basketball, we're, you probably could. All right. Something that's When we do our basketball preview, we, we could. Uh, there's some good things in Kentucky. We'll get to that. Yeah. But uh, what? let me ask you, what are you most um, concerned about? We'll start off with that. Well, concern, that's a good one because um, this is about as excited as I've been – leading into a year um, for Mississippi State football since probably 99, 2000. More than last um, year when you were going to score 42 points a game? Well, last year, I, I'm a, you know, as Drew says, I'm a pretty much an optimist, you know, I'm a pretty optimistic guy. Right. Um, and, and Drew tries to, you know, come across as this realist person, but he's more of the half, the glass half empty type side of things but he's uh, a fan on the yeah, edge yeah exactly <laughs> but or, or i should say the ledge the the concern that i had last year there's two things that i had a concern with number one was the schedule last year it was set up to where if you got off to a good start then it could really just vault you into a, an unbelievable year or it could trip you up and you and you struggle the rest of the way, which is what happened. Um, the other thing was Chris Ralph coming back at quarterback, and you know, for most state fans, there was optimism that he was going, you know, he's going to pick up from the Gator Bowl days and kind of go into next season with all this confidence. But the thing that I understood was, or that that I kind of always kept in the back of my mind was, you know, is that his ceiling, <laughs> the Gator Bowl? I mean, do you think he's going to get that much better? Um, and you know, he was a guy that wasn't going to throw the football and, um, you know, and, and we ended up having some injuries on the line and he didn't have, you know, he didn't have a lot of room for error and Re- when that happened. Ralph? Yeah. And then when you actually kind of get that with the loss of a little bit of confidence, um, we knew it was going to be pretty difficult. And then you had a defense that you didn't really know anything about. I mean, you had all three linebackers that you were replacing. You didn't know about the defensive line. And so you knew that was going to be a working process. They were going to have to score 40 points, right? Um, so, I mean, the concern that I have coming in this year is probably going to be more on the offensive line. If I can, if I can look at one spot um, and field goal kicker. Um, basically, we lost um, field goal kicker from last year. The guy that was lined up to actually take his place is terrible, and he was terrible in spring. So I think they're actually going to give a true freshman basically the the ability just to kind of take over uh, and go from that. And but now your guy was what all SEC last year? No, the, he just, was two just, years ago. Okay. he was really good. Um, Derek D. Pasquale um, is was his name, but he had a little bit of confidence issue last year. He missed two two field goals and then 
Mullen ended up yanking him and again the Alabama game and it just kind of got a little bit sideways um, on it. But, you know, the guy that was coming in was supposed to get deep on kickoffs and he could never kick it deep and he just hasn't been a real good field goal kicker um, in the spring and, and what he showed last year. So, uh, but the offensive line's where everything's going to show again. Um, we've got some new additions. Um, if we can keep some guys healthy, I mean, that's what killed us last year. Um, I, I think we've got a chance to um, to really, really have a very successful season. But, again, it's going to start off with that Auburn game um, and, uh, and, and kind of go straight on from there. But uh, from an optimistic standpoint, the schedule is so much better this year. Um, I think most people can go, you know, Mississippi State's better later in the year. They're just a better football team than they are early in the year. But the problem was that you've got Auburn, LSU, and, you know, Georgia back-to-back years. I mean, if you lose two of those or three of those, you're you're down, you know, you're one and two or oh and three going into the October. Right. And you can't really kind of get your, your – um, your bearings, but I think the schedule this year, you know, with Jackson State opening up, you got Auburn at home. Um, you know, if you win the Auburn game, really out of the first seven games, you got at Kentucky and you've got Tennessee at home before you roll into the meat of the schedule, which is Alabama, Texas A&M, LSU, Arkansas, and Ole Miss. I mean, it's insane, last five games. Um, but uh, I think you can gain some momentum and get into some areas of 6-1, and one, possibly 7-0. and oh. Um, going into Bama if you can take care of Auburn in the very first part of that schedule. So, um, so I've, from, a, from a fan standpoint, I think the ceiling is so much greater this year. Um, well, and but I, can you falter? Yeah. And, and you brought up the last year, and, and that's the one thing that you don't have uh, with all the expectations last year going into the season that you don't have mm-hmm. this year is a quarterback controversy. Mm-hmm. Or uh, it wasn't really yeah. controversy. It was we're going to play two quarterbacks. Yeah. You know, it's it's Tyler's team, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, his it's to win or lose, and and you've got a freshman as his backup, right? Yeah. So I mean, there's a there's a wide gap there as opposed to Rel. yeah. It's going to be the first time since Mullen's been here that you're going to have one guy that's set to go, and we're going to hand it over to him, and and he's going to make the make the hay, and it's Tyler Russell and. Um, but it was good that he, they made the switch to Russell late in the season last yeah. year. I mean, if I remember correctly. Yeah, he saved that UAB game yeah. for us. I mean, uh, and he, he played well, ended up getting hurt, um, tweaked the knee, you know, in one of those games. But you know, Tyler's biggest problem. And now, what, didn't he start the season as the starter? He started uh, – he did not start last year. Okay. But he did start like three games towards the middle, towards the latter part of the year. Okay. He started – um, like UA, he ended up coming back and saving our UAB, but started South Carolina. Who was that first game? You all looked so impressive that first. Memphis. Memphis. Was it, I thought he was a starter. He came in and played, but Mar- okay. Ralph was a starter. Okay. I was thinking that he, he started that game, and then all of a sudden Ralph took yeah. over. But, okay. Yeah, Ralph came in, and um, but uh, – and. You know, it's Tyler's team, and it's going to be a totally different offense. That's what I'm excited about is that it's going to look different. And, you know, last year you had a 245-pound quarterback. So, when he got third and five, guess what? You're running a you're running a dive with the quarterback or you're running an option around the end. And if you gain four yards, guess what? You're going for it on fourth down. Well, and you uh, also had somebody in the backfield yeah. that you could depend on. Right. That you didn't necessarily – you know, that option had a great go-to. Oh, yeah. Guy, you oh, know, yeah. It was, it was a quarterback keeper, or you're throwing to Vic Ballard, and he's yeah. also missing in the backfield this yeah. year. I mean, he's moved so, on. So yeah, and um, and so it's one of those things where, from an offensive standpoint, the offensive line is what we kind of got to solidify. I think we got I think we got better depth than we did last year because I think we got guys that are ready to play. Um, we've got some junior college guys that came in, so hopefully they will be able to kind of pick up and and help with the depth from that standpoint. Um, the problem is, is that we, if we can just stay injury free, I mean, last year we just kept getting hit on the injury front. So you hope that that karma kind of leads to, um, a little bit different from that standpoint. And you're not going to be running the ball probably as much. I mean, it's going to be a passing attack. Uh, we've got five senior wide receivers. But you've got a good arm uh, with Russell too. I mean, yeah. I mean, he's not as mobile as Ralph was, right? No. 
but he's got the he's more of the prototypical step back or drop back kind yeah. of passer. And what he struggled with the first two years was, you know, the the biggest knock on on Russell was he had fifty five percent completion percentage, and he had you know eight touchdowns, but he had six interceptions. Well, the problem is. He just kept always – he always wanted to go deep. He always wanted to throw the ball down the field, and he never really kind of managed the offense. And they said that's the biggest, biggest, greatest stride that he's done this year is that if we can actually see that, you know, he dumps the ball off to Ladarius Perkins and he gets four yards and we go on to the next play, that's what we kind of got to see out of him. Um, I think it's going to be a little bit different. I think Mississippi State fans have got to understand that you're going to be in second and 15 because he's going to take a sack if you throw the ball more. Um, third down efficiency. I mean, you can't line him up and go, we're going to just do a dive for five yards, and if we don't, we're just going to go for it again like we did last year. I mean, we could do that. And I think Ralph, is, you're going to have bigger plays, um, but you may not be as efficient. Um, but uh, I'm looking forward to it because you got – so you're going to have more of those home run type plays. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think you're going to see a tag down the middle double. of the I mean, field. Yeah. Because um, you all lived off the single and double last yeah. year. And the other thing that's going to add to it is you have Joe Morrow, who is a name that you need to keep an eye on because he's a 6'4", about 210-pound wide receiver that's a redshirt freshman. And he basically – they almost pulled his red shirt last year in like the eighth game because he was just completely destroying practice. And they, they talked Mullen out of not pulling his red shirt. And um, – but he has completely destroyed spring, and he is a big receiver that State doesn't have. You know, if you if you remember, Mullen got there and got those five receivers, and they're all 5'10 to 6 foot. You know, Chad Bumpus, Brandon Heavens, Chris Smith, Arcedo Clark, all these guys. And they really haven't done much, you know. I mean, Chad Bumpus, I mean, he was a five-star, you know. I mean, he was going to Florida before Mullen, you know, changed where he was going. So, you're wanting those guys to, you know, they're mature – They've been through the ropes for three years, and it's their time to actually do something. And I think it's going to open up where they weren't utilized at all. I mean, ref didn't – they didn't have the consistency to throw the football down the field. But Joe Morrow brings something that's totally different to the table because he can catch a four-yard slant and take it 60 yards because he's, you know, he's got a – he's a 4-4, four, four, you know, guy. So, he can get deep. Um, and then we have Malcolm Johnson who actually is hurt – um, which was a little bit of bad news, but he's the tight end that came on last year as a redshirt freshman. Big kid, 6'5", about 225 pounds, really more of a wide receiver, hybrid. Um, had 10 catches for like 152 yards in the spring game. So uh, we get him back in the, about the third or fourth game of the year. It's going to be, uh, I think, a chance to be good. Um, and then you got Ladarius Perkins and you have Nick Griffin, who's a name you need to keep an eye on because – they're thinking that he's going to be the guy that's just going to be the next tailback that just steps in at 6'1 and 225 pounds that's going to be able to, to run downhill. You so, think, from an offensive standpoint. Do you think he's got a, a, a chance to con, uh, compete against Perkins to take that starting I position? Think, yeah, or do you think they're just going to share the, share the load over there? Well, Perkins gets kind of – Perkins kind of gets a little bit of a bad rap that he's kind of a speed guy and he catches the ball out of the – backfield and not he's a, more of a not a pound him down the front. right and so but he's a thick kid I mean he's 215 pounds and he's you know he's about 5'11 so he's not he's not like he can't run between the tackles and and he's trying to shed that that tag on him um he, he does, so I think yeah. he's gonna get I mean I think that's what hurt us um I think that's what hurt us some, uh, if you remember two years ago when we played Auburn the second game, you had Vic Ballard and, and Perkins, and they really couldn't figure out who was who, you know, because they were both new to the program. So they were doing this committee thing, and Ballard ended up about the third game kind of taking the kind of taking the thing over. And um, so they uh, – and, and by doing that, it, it almost really basically cost us a game because Ballard, if we would have stayed with Ballard and run him. So I'm hoping that he gives Perkins a shot, but I, I know that Nick Griffin's going to come in and get a bulk of carries. And everything that they actually say is that he has an opportunity to be another, you know, Anthony Dixon type, um, big, big back that's athletic and just runs downhill and, uh, and just to be a bruiser type. So, um, so it should be a nice change up uh, on offense. All right, what part of Mississippi State Bulldogs football are you most excited about? That one, what is the one thing? 
defense. Okay. You know, last year we started on the on the defense side of the ball. You know, you had three linebackers that had basically never started a game, and you had really good cornerbacks. You thought, but you didn't really know. Um, had experience at safety, and you're okay on the line. Um, and so this year, you know, even though we lost Fletcher Cox, um, you know, a lot of people see that loss and they think that's a huge loss, which it is because you don't, you don't want to lose that guy. Um, but from a defensive standpoint, defensive line standpoint, I think you've got um, the ability to be way more consistent. The linebackers, I mean, just think about this. The linebackers, Cam Lawrence, who's going to be the returning lead returning tackler uh, in the SEC, you know, he's 6'3", 230 pounds. We have Dante Skinner, who is our other outside linebacker, at 6'5", 240. And he's just athletic as can be. And possibly our middle linebacker, who we have to replace, who's who graduated. Um, but we actually have two, Fernando Bohanna, who's about 6', probably about 6'1", about 230. 225, but but we have this redshirt freshman kid that's come out of there just unbelievable in spring, made a lot of plays, uh, is 6'5", 245 pounds. Wow. And so there's a chance that you're actually got three linebackers that are over 6'3", and over 230 pounds. And that's just done – I mean, that's just – That's just big. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, so I don't think from a standpoint of seeing how we developed as a defense last year where we started – and where we got to, uh, I think coming into the year, we're going to be so consistent on defense from the beginning. I think we're going to have a bigger uh, edge pass rush uh, with Danico Autry, who was, you know, the the junior college defensive player of the year um, that we actually snagged. And he, he should kind of help solidify that. But uh, then you've got Jonathan Banks and those cornerbacks in the secondary that are – you know, I mean, Jonathan Banks is an All-American. I mean, candidate. I mean, he's an All-SEC uh, caliber, you know, six three, two hundred and fifteen pound cornerback that you just don't come around very often. So, um, I think from the standpoint, that's going to be where we really kind of make our statement. I think we're going to be way more consistent on defense um, from the get-go this year, with I think a little bit of a lighter schedule. Um, so, if we can get Russell in off to a good start on offense, um, you know, and I think it comes down to the Auburn game. If we get on the right start in Auburn, I mean, we're rolling out six and one to seven and zero oh, uh, with Tennessee coming to the house, and so that's just a pretty right. good spot to be. And 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 we're at the point where and and that's led me to where we are at now, where I go through each team or each team that you have, and you tell me win or loss and see where you end up. And right. You've already alluded to, I think, the first six or seven games, so it should be yeah. pretty – we should be able to roll through those. But I think so. First one, you're going to start off with Jacksonville – or Jackson State. Yeah, that's a W. And Auburn? Auburn, I'm going ahead and doing a W. I think there's too much on the line. They've, they've won 10 out of the last 11 years. We've lost the last four straight. And last the last was, two – Last year was a been, heartbreaker, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, and not only a heartbreaker. I mean, two years ago was a heartbreaker. You know, you catch a ball on Thursday night. You know, all you gotta do is catch a ball on the sidelines. You're kicking a field goal for the win. The kid drops it, and um, and so you just you you had both of them, and it, it's just frustrating from that standpoint. But I think from looking at Mississippi State, I think matching up with Auburn, I think we're a better football team than Auburn early in the year with their quarterback situation. Um, and I think we're playing it at home, and I think it just means more. Um, and it's getting off on that start. And we've lost the 12 SEC openers in a row. So, dude, there's a lot of stuff that we got to get off our back. I mean, you know what I'm saying? I, and, no, and, we have no idea what <laughs> losing streaks are like at Kentucky. But so this is the game that that's going to start everything, and it's going to and it's going to decide this the way the season goes i mean i think last year you saw it i mean it was such a heart-wrenching loss that somehow or another five days later you got to play lsu on thursday night and you give it everything you got but you just didn't have enough in the tank and then you got to go to georgia the following week and so it just created this this monster that you kind of had to climb back uphill um so i'm taking a w on that one all right then you then you're gonna i know you're gonna get a w at troy yeah 
What about at South Alabama? Or no, you're hosting South Alabama. Yeah, well, they're they're in their first year, Division One, in this scenario. So it's yeah, a that's game be, for yeah, them. It's, it's a total game. And then you travel up to Lexington. Lexington. I think we'll take care of business there because we got a week off going before even going up there. So I feel pretty confident in that one. And then you host the Tennessee Volunteers. And that's the kicker. That's a swing game there. Um, you know, I'm going to say. I'm not going to go out on the limb and say that we're going to start off 7 and 0, but I feel like 6 and 1. And so I think you've got I think you can lose the Auburn game and still beat a Tennessee. Um but I think between one of those two games it's a loss. I think we're going to lose one of them. So if you win at Auburn um, you're losing Tennessee. Yeah, so okay. I'm going to go ahead and and put a Tennessee down because Tennessee is one of those teams that you just don't really know. I think I ha- I think I have a feeling about Auburn. I think we'll be more geared up for that. Um, but I will tell you that if we're five and zero heading into that Tennessee game, that's going to be a live atmosphere. Um, so I could see us winning that ball game, yeah. but but I'm going to go ahead and put it down as an L. Didn't and then of course Middle Tennessee, I think we're we're going to take care of business there. Don't 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 stumble across those guys down those Blue Raiders. I know they're get, they're getting better. Uh, you know they they've played I don't know how many SEC opponents every year for the last ten years or yeah. so and. Oh yeah. One of these days they're going to sneak up and beat somebody. I, I don't. Know. I don't think it's you guys this year, but yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely gonna be not. Interesting. A, it's definitely not a team you can take lightly anymore. All right, so we're at Alabama, October twenty seventh. So that's yeah, I'm going to say obviously you're going to take a loss there, um, and I'm interested to see where we're going to be at that time because I think a six and one or even a seven and zero oh Mississippi State team nobody would think you know. And all of a sudden you're going into Alabama. That could be a top fifteen, top twenty, you know, ranking. If you're six and one, you're all, um, you're all of a sudden the you're in the top game. twenty. Yeah. So I mean, uh, it, it could be a really interesting atmosphere. But um, you know, playing in Tuscaloosa, I, I'm going to put that down as an L. All right. Then you host A and M. Texas A and M. I think this is one of those swing games. I think Auburn, Tennessee, and Texas A and M. I think you got to win two of those three. And uh, so I think Texas A and M at home. I think we're I think that's the game that you got to win, and so I think we'll win that ball game. At LSU, we just we hadn't won there in a freaking quarter century, so I don't see us doing it anytime soon. So when it happens, I'll just be drinking and having a good time. Arkansas, that's about it. Arkansas, man, we played them so well at home. So what's that at? We've got three losses. Yes. I'm going to say I'm going to take an L on that one. And I'm going to take a W at Ole Miss. That should get us eight wins, eight right? Eight four, yeah. I, I think eight. I think eight's a number that I think Mississippi State fans are excited about. I think that there's a possibility we'll be favored in ten ball games this year outside of Alabama and, and LSU because I think we'll be favored at the games at home. I think we'll be favored – at Kentucky and Ole Miss, and I think we'll be favored at with Auburn and Tennessee coming in. So, um, and where where you differ with, I guess, the experts is SEC play. Yeah, you know, you you're giving them a chance to win four, four games, games yeah. in the SEC versus you know a lot of places one, two, or three uh, wins coming for you guys in the SEC. And I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, you know, and this is kind of where my stance is, and it, and it's basically the philosophy that I believe Scott Strickland, the AD, and Dan Mullen have basically done for Mississippi State is, you know, I grew up as a state fan, and for the last 25 years, it was more of a, um, a can't-do attitude. It was woe-is-me type of deal where they would go, you know, where the leadership at Mississippi State would go, you know what? If we're going to win football games, we got to follow, you know, an Alabama, right? We got to we got to model our thing after Alabama, which makes no sense because we're not Alabama. We don't have a hundred million dollar budget, and we're not going to get the tradition, you know, the, the recruiting, you know, that to, that kind of that whole train running. And so, what I think Scott Strickland and Mullen have done is they've said. We're coming in here. We're Mississippi State. We're not going to worry about what we can't do. We're going to basically change things up. We're going to create a great atmosphere. 
we're going to keep kids in state so that Alabama and LSU don't come and pull the top four players out of the state. Right. And then you have a plan. We're going to bring kids in. We're going to redshirt them. We're going to develop them. And that's how we're going to do things. And the one thing that they consistently said is that you you can't go from three wins to winning a national championship. That the only way you can win championships is if you actually win consistently. And I, I, it just makes total sense on how they've actually structured everything. And there, and that's what Dan Mullen said last year. His his goal last year was it's the biggest year in Mississippi State history because guess what? They won nine ball games before, but they won three the next year. So what we got to do is we got to figure out a way to get to another bowl game. And guess what? We started out zero and four in the SEC. I mean, and we figured out a way to get to six and six. And then we won our bowl game and ended up seven and six, had a winning right. season. So, and what happened is, is that you got those players that won nine ball games two years ago, probably got patted on the back. Everybody's excited. They didn't really work that hard. Bam. They struggle through there, barely get to a bowl game. And they go, you know what? Seven wins isn't good enough. And so you got that little bit of a hunger back type of deal. And Dan Mullen, what's he going to say this year? That it's. Most important year because now you got to put not only two in a row, you got to do three in a row, and, and you got to up the ante. Yeah. And uh, so, I mean, he's redshirted 19 guys two years ago, 18 guys last year. He'll probably, I mean, we signed 28 players this year. Probably got a good chance of seeing six or seven actually play this year. She's going to be, you know, right at that 19 to 20 redshirt again. So he's developing the depth, and he's keeping kids in state. He's making this is our state slogan means something. It's ticked off Ole Miss, and that's what he wants to do. And if you can go out and win eight ball games this year and go to a nice bowl game, I mean, because I, I think they can get to nine wins, but they can also end up at six and six. And we'll we'll end it with this here with with the Mississippi State talk. But you're you're talking about winning the state, and it's not so much that they're getting players at Ole Miss isn't. They're not losing. Right. Ole Miss isn't losing players to Mississippi State. It's that Mississippi State is getting the players that were going to the LSU's, the Alabamas, the Auburns. Right. Uh, they were keeping those guys in state, and so it, realistically, I know from a from an outsider looking in, it's not that Mississippi State is bragging that that's right. our state to Ole Miss. Yeah, it's just they're they're using that slogan to say we want our guys to stay in the yeah. state. They're making it mean something. Yeah, but now and the Ole Miss guys are going to turn it around. Yeah. Exactly. And, and so oh, yeah. And, and they're going to, you know, but it's it's one of those things where even Hugh Freeze has even got a different philosophy. It's it's one of those things where Dan Mullen has basically said, I'm recruiting and I'm going to heavily do it. I mean, we got like 68% of the players on the team are from Mississippi. I mean, his whole thing is we got enough players, you know. Um, there's players here. We just got to keep them here. We got to make it important, you know, and all that type of stuff. And so I think – I kind of like the philosophy. And what, what's happened in football is bled over into other things, and I think you can see that with the hires that we made with John Cohen and with some of the Olympic sports. You know, they're going after young, energetic coaches that have a vision and a plan. Um, and even they did it with Rick Ray in basketball. I mean, he was a kind of this outside guy, um, but he's high energy. He develops kids. He's got a vision. And that's what they're wanting to do. And they're just basically saying, we're going to support you. We're going to do the marketing and we're going to do all this and we're going to make it all about it. But we're going to be Mississippi State and not try to em, you know, emulate somebody else that we're really not because we've done things good before. We've, we've gone to a Final Four. We've won 10 ball games. We've gone to the College World Series 100 times, but we've never done it on a consistent basis. And that's what the next step is. So it's kind of interesting. Well, we're talking about a team now that – that we would just love some consistency. We've had it. We've gotten used to it at Kentucky. Yeah. And 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 you know the fans are are coming out and letting us letting people know that they're not going to accept uh, an inconsistent program any longer. And and you know I saw something just the other day that that ticket sales are down twenty seven percent over last year and thirty seven percent from their high in two thousand nine uh, during the Rich Brooks era of Kentucky football. Now, we know that the economy is going to have to play something into right. that. Uh, you know, they've even went out to, to do some, some of those packages where there's only four or five games versus the full season ticket package. Right. 
um, to, to try to help boost some season ticket sales. And I think that will be effective because I do believe that the economy has so has an effect on that. Uh, Lexington and that area in Kentucky's, you know, not like Nashville. They've not been as insulated as we have from all right. these this economic downturn. So so you do do feel that that's going to play something into it. Uh, but it is also the fact that they're talking with their their pocketbook. I mean, eight national championships in basketball and yeah. a, a losing season in football. That doesn't work yeah. at, at Kentucky anymore. Uh, you know, con- the football place is not – and w- Kentucky's consistently had a, a strong attendance, and just yeah. like Mississippi State, even though they've not been extremely competitive – the games have always been well attended, so yeah. so that's the first thing where uh, you see that that there's some discord uh, up in Lexington. Now, but what you do also have is you've got an AD, Mitch Barnhart, who is at least outwardly marketing that he is a hundred percent behind Joker Phillips. And as a Kentucky fan, you know I I'm like him. Are there better coaches possibly out here than Joker Phillips? I'm going to say yes. Oh yeah. But, you know, just like Mississippi State's had a history of doing, they hired, you know, Phillips is a, a, a former Kentucky guy, yeah. wide receiver in the 80s. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's he's what legends are made of yeah. in the state of Kentucky type of thing. And so for him to be able to coach that program, there's no doubt that the passion is not there. Yeah. You know, can he recruit the right players? Um, and, and he's had some good recruiting years. I mean, that's what he did great yeah. when, when Brooks was there. He was a great recruiter. Um, you know, as a head coach, you don't recruit the same way. So, how has that transitioned for him? He's a first-time head coach in the in Division One, for first time ever, I think. Yeah. But what you see with that is that last year, uh, Kentucky was not a deep program. Uh, you you look at the the roster from top to, f- to top to bottom, and there's there was not a lot of depth in any one position. And then you had injuries start to happen. Yeah. Uh, you, you had injuries left and right. You had running backs going out, wide receivers going back, quarterbacks going out. Uh, and so you just had all this unknown because you had nothing in the background to, to take its place. On the defensive side, you had two key guys, um, and they stepped up and did everything they could uh, with Trevathan and Guy, Winston Guy and Danny Trevathan. They, they're now in the pros this year. Leaves a lot of question marks on the, the defensive side. I think they lost six defensive starters, four yeah. linebackers, and two corners. Yeah. Uh, so you cut a lot of holes that you've got to fill, mm. and, and there wasn't depth in there to take its place. So so there's a lot of unknowns there. But you've got some great recruits as far as Kentucky standards. We're not getting four and five stars uh, because we're not competing against the Alabamas. And, and I do think that there is a lot of inflation a three-star becomes a four-star. A four-star becomes a five-star because they put Alabama or LSU on their list. You know, the the rivals in 24-7 and stuff are giving them the benefit of the doubt, and they almost get an extra star because they're, oh, yeah. you know, they're being recruited by one of those program, one of those top-tier programs. You and I don't want to just say in the SEC. You know, if they're looking at USC out west or Oregon, uh, and Texas down southwest. You know, if you, those are one of your schools that they're recruiting you, I think you actually get a uh, – there's no mathematical formula that's proven this or anything, but I think you actually get an extra star. It's like extra credit at, in school um, because you're being recruited by one of those programs. And generally, Kentucky doesn't get one of those players. They're not recruiting against those type of individuals. Uh, Kentucky's also not not blessed like Mississippi. There is not a lot of talent that comes right. from the state of Kentucky, uh, at least in football. So if you're looking about winning your state, you're talking about fighting against the Cardinals for three players or a handful yeah. of small players. And, uh, you know, the chances are you're going to get those, but at best they're going to be a three-star player anyways. Yeah. So uh, I think we're lucky to – I think we got a freshman that's coming in that's a four-star. Yeah, the quarterback. Yeah. Um, he's a good recruit. Uh, and he's a Kentucky boy, is he yeah. not? So Fort I mean, somewhere. Fort Thomas Highlands. That too, yeah. yeah up right outside of Cincinnati. Uh, but that's a that's a f- that's a football hotbed for the state of Kentucky yeah. if there is a hotbed. Hot yeah. uh, that and Louisville, yeah. I mean, we're Mail and yeah. Xavier, some of those private and schools uh, up there. But what you don't have is you don't have that. You know, you said sixty eight percent of your team is yeah. from the state of Mississippi, and I bet a good two thirds of that percentage were players that were being recruited by the LSU's yeah. and the, Missi- the Alabamas and Auburns and Floridas of the world. I mean, there's other programs out there that were looking at those guys and. You just don't have that in Kentucky. So, yeah. as far as an uphill battle, it's a hard state to play football in. And so, 
you, you have a program that's not very deep, that you have a program that's not able to recruit from the state. You're going outside the state to have to recruit for those players. It makes it a very difficult program to be able to, to compete on a high level yeah. year in and year out. Uh, and, and last year you saw that the injuries really hurt them. It cost them some games. Um, you know, I think they had one of the – uh, they were like the fifth lowest scoring team yeah. in the country last year with 22 uh, touchdowns. I, I, I see a, a big change in that. And and also, you know, I'm going to even go two years back. How do you replace a Randall Cobb? Yeah. I mean. Derek Locke. And Derek Locke. Those two players. Andre were, Woodson. Well, just those two or three players were like 80% of your yeah. offense between three players. Burton. When they're wide receiver, Burton, Kendrick Burton or whatever yeah, his name was. He was a few years back. Um, but God, man, they had, I mean, and, and guess who was the offensive coordinator that threw the ball all over the place was Joker Phillips. Right. You know, so, I mean, he when you got the horses there, you can, you can do run. stuff with it. Yeah. But you had, you had Randall Cobb and Locke, those two in particular, you know, those accounted for two-thirds of your oh, yeah. offense from your quarterback and running back. Yeah. And, and that quarterback – was a receiver, was a kick returner, yeah. was a Everything. punt returner. I mean, he did it all. And so just to say l- last year that void in itself is, is almost impossible to replace. And so you throw in uh, Newton who just could, uh, for all indications, I mean, coming in as a freshman, he could have, Morgan Newton should have been able to step in. But for whatever reason – and the fates are, are, have just yeah. done this to Kentucky this year. He's not developing like you want him to. Right. And, th- and that happens to players all the time. Unfortunately, it's in a key position at quarterback that you had a huge gap to replace, yeah. and he wasn't able to fill those shoes. Now, la- late last year, you had Maxwell Sw- Smith come in. Yeah, uh, came in against Mississippi State and played really well. And, and got injured just before the last game at Tennessee. You know, hid 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 those injuries to to perform a <laughs> miracle against Tennessee um, by him him not playing. But uh, you know, he had a great spring, yeah. much improved passing accuracy. Uh, he's got that arm that we want to see. Uh, you've got some young talent there to back up Larod King, who's the yeah. who's a senior wide receiver. Um, but you've got uh, you know Daryl Collins, who who was a redshirt freshman. Uh, he's now in there. He's going to be a great a- addition to the wide receiving core. And DeMarco Robinson, who's a yeah. sophomore, got a few touches last year, but he's really developed. So you've got a couple guys that are finally out there that we didn't have last year that could catch the ball. Um, your running back is still some some concerns. you got Koshik yeah, Williams, um, but he's not going to be – you know, he's got that same uh, – Tag, he's got that same tag that your guys down in Mississippi State does. You know, he can catch the ball, so you can probably see a lot of stuff uh, yeah. with, the, with the running back get, catching some balls out of the, those little slants and uh, deep outs yeah. and things like that. But uh, he's not that pounded up the middle kind of guy that you get from the running back. And the same thing with their other guy, Raymond Sanders. Yeah. Uh, which Don't you have – do you all still have Josh Clemens? He, he tore his MCL yeah. last year, uh, and he's not 100%. Okay. And, and, and word is out of camp that he might not even be – uh, ahead, even Ready, on schedule, yeah. might be a little behind schedule. And he's that pounded down the middle type of back um, that Kentucky needs to gotcha. have in there. So, you know, even if he's coming out from – I think he I think he did that midseason, six games yeah. in. Uh, so, you know, he you expected him if he was on schedule or ahead of schedule to be ready. Right. Start of the season and he's not. So, you know, we'll get him back at some point this season and that's going to help our running game. But, you know, to start the season off, we're not going to have him. And – and in Kentucky, we start week one with one of the biggest games we have, you know, right. with, with the oh, governor. Yeah. The with governors. a good squad, yeah, with a good squad, too. Yeah, I Louisville's, Louisville's going to be good. I mean, they're top 25 in some people's estimation. So, But if you look at the, what's their coach's name up there? Uh, Charlie Strong. Yes, yeah, so did you see Strong's comments this week uh-huh. about that? You know, he was being asked about would he like to play in the SEC, and, you know, he basically was, you know, said, I wouldn't want to have that SEC schedule. So – He's basically saying that because he has a light schedule with Louisville's conference, that that's why they're as good as they are. So, yeah. so there might be a little inflation oh, yeah. there um, because they are are playing not playing in the SEC. So, so a little jab there. I think offensively, when I was doing a little look, I mean, it seems like offensively you got the quarterback you think is going to be okay. Yeah. You got running backs. He's got three or four of them that you should be from a committee standpoint be able to figure something out. It may take you a little bit. 
Um, and then you and then you're a little bit more secure, I think, from a wide receiver standpoint than even you were last year. Um, definitely, and, and you definitely. hope that Larod King actually is able to kind of get a little bit of a breather and not just be so isolated. Um, but really, it comes down to that offensive line, and that's where everything you know it's all the lines deal. But I think you got if I if I read correctly, you got three starters that like 87 games or something yeah. that had you're combined started for you. So you're replacing pretty experienced guys. And uh, I don't know enough about Kentucky football to know if they've got three guys that are going to be able to fill in. So that sounds like that's where you're really going to make what your offense is going to be about. I don't, I don't think they could be much worse than they were last year. So they really only have from an offensive standpoint, you think they're going to be better. Um, but, man, that defensively – that's where your questions are. Yeah, and the the question that we have at Kentucky is the fact that you're right. You know, offensively, we're going to score more than 22 touchdowns this year yeah. because all indications are everything is improved on the offense. When you win a game with a wide receiver at quarterback, anything's possible. Anything is possible. You know, you're struggling on offense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. Because I, I think he threw the ball like four times that game. I. I can't oh, yeah, remember. it was awesome, dude. I remember sitting there in Starkville, Mississippi, getting ready for the Egg Bowl, watching that thing going, this is not happening. Yeah, that's what Tennessee was saying the oh, whole yeah. game. <laughs> it was unreal. <laughs> but you're right. The, the question becomes, though, is does their offense improve more than their defense is hurt by the right. loss of uh, your guy and Trevathan and the rest of the defense that's not there any yeah. longer? I mean, I, and this is what I loved about your defense when I was doing my research. Obviously, the defensive line is solid. Yes. Right? Yeah. But check out the four guys' names. Possibly the best defensive lineman names in college football. You got Collins Ukwu, right? Isn't that how you say it? Yes. Then you got Dante Rump. You got Mr. Cobble. <laughs> I love that first name. And then, uh, I mean, this guy, just his name just breeds that he's a defensive player that's in the SEC. Alvin Dupree. <laughs> Like, he's just, you know – I mean, so I was just reading it. I just thought it was pretty funny. I mean, that's just great. I was just – that's what caught my eye. So, I don't know if that's good for you that I actually recognize the names over the stuff. But it sounds like from – your defensive line is going to be, you know, good, yeah. you think. Um, so, you're hoping they can get enough penetration that it's going to be able to hide some of the stuff that from behind. But, you know, they struggled last year. I think from a – Secondary it's, it's gonna be, standpoint, it's going to be all about pressure it this might year. Be, you might actually be better that you got new people there because they were terrible last year. I mean, from the cornerback standpoint, yeah, from the corner, yeah. yeah. I mean, so the secondary, if they got past guys. They just got new more people. They can't be any worse than those suckers they had last year. You just had freaking two guys that you know had fourteen hundred and thirty-two tackles last year. Yeah, the t first and third leading tacklers in the SEC coming from the same team. Yeah, that says that's not what you want. <laughs> It does if the others were able yeah. to contribute. I'd like to have about five guys at about 80 tackles, <laughs> ideally. But that's just another story for another day. But you're right. Uh, what you're going to see from our defense, and, and I, 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 since we're doing a podcast on each of our teams, I'm going to use that possessive, even though it, it's, it's the Kentucky Wildcats. I have, I've never played for them, so I can't say I'm a, a Wildcat in that, that sense of the term. But – and what you have with the Wildcats is the fact that uh, you're going to see some defensive schemes that are are going to be creative. You're not going to see, you know, those guys that bend don't break mentality can't work uh, with the, with Kentucky because there's nothing behind it to keep it from breaking. If it gets past that first line, you know, th those corners aren't aren't tested enough, and you're going to see some big plays happen against that defense. You're going to see some creative schemes, uh, and and some coaching that's going to allow them to apply pressure so that the other teams have to change their game plan a little bit. If they do that with some success, then you're going to see an offense that's going to be able to create points uh, in a, a larger fashion than they did the year before and give the opportunity for some wins. Uh, th that's my opinion on this thing, and, and, and that's the way that you're going to have to beat, you know, the, the you, you're going to have to beat Clay Travis in this four and a half. Yeah. You, for those who listen outside the Nashville area in the Lexington area, unfamiliar, but the local broadcaster here, Clay Travis, just laid a grand against the Kentucky Wildcats, uh, taking the under. And, uh, you know, that's the uh, 
if you look at that though, that's really the favorite. the The favorite pick is under four and a half for Kentucky and Vegas because they're given one forty five. Yeah. Because I, I I see a picture of this slip. Yeah. Uh, he tweeted out a picture as proof to uh, Matt Jones up there at Kentucky Sports Radio, uh, who in turn laid a laid a laid a grand to cover. So. Vegas just made juice on a thousand, regardless. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so uh, they, they have that going for them. Uh, but let's look at their schedule real quick. You want to go through those since? Yeah, you got September second, which is a Sunday. Um, you're playing at Louisville. Um, that's going to be a tough opponent right there. Uh, at playing at the uh, Papa John's Stadium or whatever you call it, where you can drink. Where you can drink at Papa John's? Yeah. <coughs> can you drink she your pepperonis? I have no idea. <laughs> you think you're going to get a W in that one? If there's a game we could steal, it's that one. Because last year, that game at Lexington, we let it slip away. We actually yeah. They actually had a really good chance to beat Louisville uh, and didn't execute the way they needed to and let that game get away. So they do have a chance because everybody's got them losing that game. Uh, Louisville might not come in co- as prepared as they want, but I'm still going to give them. I'm going to give them a, a loss. You give them a loss. I am going to give them a loss. I'm going to give them a win here in a minute. That's going to surprise you. Say, I, I'd be surprised if they beat Louisville at Louisville, um, <coughs> just because I think Louisville. I think from, I think I think from a quarterback standpoint with Bridgewater, I'm I'm interested to see how Louisville plays this year. And now I, I think they got the ceiling to be pretty decent. I think um, they will lose, but I would not be surprised if they yeah. won. It's a rivalry game. You never know what's going to happen. Is. Kent State. We'll give them the win. I'll give you a W one on that one. This is one that I thought was kind of interesting, the WKU, where there's a lot of people are saying that that could actually be one that could be a lot more difficult than you think. Well, I mean, Western gave them a hard time last year. Yeah, that was an awful football game. But there again, we're talking about Kentucky's offensive – uh, ability not to score last year versus it wasn't a matter that Kentucky played bad defense. It was just they couldn't score any points against Western. So who do you go with this? Do you go with your alma mater or do you go with your big blue? I, the blue's going to win that one. All right. Because I was to say, I mean, WKU could just be totally looking past Kentucky because they got Southern Miss coming in the next week. I doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> and then you got, all right, this is a tough stretch. You know, I looked at Mississippi State schedule and I go, okay, you got at Alabama, Texas A&M at home, LSU on the road, Arkansas at home, at Ole Miss. Pretty good, pretty tough five game stretch. Check this out. Buddy. Oh, I know. At Florida, and that's South Carolina, Mississippi State, at Arkansas, Georgia, Missouri, Vanderbilt. Are you kidding me, man? I know. We're you, no- you want to loop all those together and see if you got any W's out of those? I'm going to go with the first one. I think they're going to steal one in, jo- in Florida. Florida? Uh, and, and, you know, if you look, look at – this guy, are we three and one going into September 29th? And I say, it's going to change quickly after that. <laughs> um, so you're going to go down to Gainesville and get a W. And I, and I don't have it in front of me. Was it 26 years in a row we've lost to Florida? I can tell you right quick here. Um, the last win in Gainesville is 1979, dropping 16 straight trips by 25 points per game with only two being decided by a touchdown or less. And But overall, I mean, I think it's like 20 – it's like right up there with Tennessee last year. They were only trailing us by a year or two as far as consecutive yeah. beatdowns to Kentucky. So you go back-to-back with historical wins. And get them out of the – we're, we're, we're going to start all over. So get rid of them all. Tennessee like – Vanderbilt a couple years ago, Tennessee – uh, and now we're getting rid of Florida this year. That's that's you, my man. surprise. Now, after that, it's not going to look so good for a while. South Carolina at home. Oh, we're going to lose. Mississippi State at home. We're going to lose. At Arkansas. We're going to lose. Yeah. Georgia at home. We're going to lose. At Missouri. We're going to lose. <laughs> Vanderbilt at home. I think we can beat Vanderbilt. Uh, James Franklin's got a great program there. They're going the r- in the right direction. Um, but I do see that some of those losses to be closer losses, they're not going to be blowouts that Kentucky's used to. I think they can come in and, and take Vanderbilt. All right, then you got a bye week finally, and then you're going to be hosting Samford. Win. W. And 
at Tennessee. We're going to lose again. <laughs> they will not lose to us th- th- two years in a row. Uh, it, Dooley has eaten so much crow over that loss that you know that game was scheduled on their their calendar at the second that, the second the clock hit triple zeros. Yeah, you could be five weeks into season, and not really care what happens at the end of the season because there it's all off the tracks, and he's just buying time or. He finishes it out and, yeah, takes care of business. So, what's that give us? Five wins. I'm with Matt Jones. I think we're going to cover. Five. Nice, man. <clears throat> and one of those, you know, the Florida game could be traded with somebody else there. I mean, realistically, it could be traded with uh, with Louisville. Yeah. It could be traded with Tennessee. Yeah, uh, I mean, Mississippi State. I mean. It, it could go either yeah, way. I think we got a bye week before it. So, if you're 4-0. And you got a bye week, and you could come in a little bit off course. And that game's always been a good game yeah. between the two yeah. two programs. So, you know, there's that win has some flexibility going to Florida, but I do see that there's there's an actual fifth win on that schedule um, that that Vegas doesn't want to give us. So, uh, I like our chances to have five wins. Will it be those five teams? Three of them, yes. <laughs> the other two, magic can happen, but. Uh, you know, it's – who knows if if we can steal one more from somebody. Now we're talking six and six and six in a bowl game. To be honest with you, I'm hoping Louisville beats y'all so I don't have to listen to my in-laws just gripe and moan forever. Yeah. That makes one of us. So. I know. Yeah. Huh. I know you want to win. So. Yeah. <clears throat> but, you know, what's good about that game is that's the first game of the season for yeah. Kentucky. I, uh, I, you know, I was seeing some, some stuff on the internet, and it, it brings up some good points. Um, I always take a guy's trip that second or third week uh, in September. It seems like that game is always on, so we're always able to go to the to the local watering hole yeah. establishments to, to catch that game. Um, so I like it in that fact, but, you know, it gives Kentucky fans all summer something to talk about. Yeah. Game one is the rivalry game. It's not the Western Kentucky or it's not the Middle Tennessee or the Sanford or whoever that, yeah. you know, smaller tier program is that we have week one, it's it's Louisville. And, you know, it'd be nice to see that stay on the schedule at some point because no matter how good or how bad each program is, uh, it, it creates excitement and conversation in, in the bluegrass state. And and for football, that's that's few and far between. That's, that's right. For, for either team, for, for Cardinal fans or for Kentucky fans, there's not always a lot to cheer about. So Well, tell me this. You know, you mentioned something about the um, – the attendance, you know, we're all kind of – we've talked about this in the past where we're kind of fighting uh, against a home theater that you're competing with. And so um, – and one of the things I've, I've, I've really found that I love – Well, I'm gonna, I, I, don't, I could be going – answering your question, right. but to me, a college football tailgating experience and an NFL football tailgating right. experience, completely, completely different. different. Yeah. Uh, so you're not – So how's the tailgating set up at – Kentucky is it like do you have like a central location or is it all like parking because I've never been there and I've always wanted to go but I know you got the Keeneland aspect you know when you get in October which is really cool to be able to go do that during the day and then go well tailgate for a night game yes and no okay Uh, I'll answer your second question first it used to be the case in Lexington but then the SEC came in with the schedule changes you know I don't know Mm -hmm. how long ago 10 years ago or so you don't know what your schedule is going to be that's right and at that point of the season you know it could be a (laughs) <laughs> it and it's actually you know it's, now it's, it's probably new, yeah now it, it's probably more in line to always be at night unless you're the 11 11 25 game you know you're more likely to have an evening start because you're not going to have not necessarily and, i mean a number of those times during october were the sec game i oh, really that that 11 that o'clock stinks. game because it's just good enough of a matchup yeah because it's like kentucky florida you know this yeah. year that could very well be the sec game Cause, yeah because they're going to get a, a pretty high choice oh okay yeah you know what i'm saying that's true yeah so there's a a lot of chance there's a pretty decent it's it's not going to be that cbs game (laughs) we're we're not there right but you know there's a there's a pretty good chance that we can end up at that 11 o'clock game and then all of a sudden you're conflicting with keeneland see i'm wondering if they but now i haven't been to a football game so i know what the you know because what's really going on right now is and how colleges have to do it and i know that Mississippi State made this huge emphasis on creating that tailgating spot 
and really creating an environment inside the stadium that is just not, hey, you're going to see a football game. It's right. the whole experience behind it. And I know Kentucky does that from a basketball standpoint. I mean, going to Rupp Arena, it's more of an experience than it is – going to see a basketball game, you know what I mean? And so I don't know, is Commonwealth Stadium, I mean, obviously you probably got to have bigger video boards and kind of do that whole thing, but I'm wondering if that's where they're going to have to actually go uh, eventually if they want to say, hey, I, or is it Kentucky is going to say, you know what, we're not going to buy tickets now, but we're going to buy them when we get there because that's just what we're going to do and we're going to have 60,000 people there. Well, I mean, and – you know, there's a lot of season tickets for every program that are going to be bought between now and August 1st right. or August 2nd. Uh, so I'm going to say they're down from last year. And, and you know, 27% over last year's total, there's a lot of ground that can be made up in five weeks, weeks yeah. uh, worth of season ticket sales. So it, that number doesn't reflect – It it's down. I, I do know yeah. that. It, but is it really down that much over last year at this point in yeah. the season? That's not the number we've been given. It was the right. number – and I think it also helps. And it was the number at the end at the, the at the end of the yeah. season season ticket sales. Yeah. So, you know, there's a good chance that it's gonna be a lot closer yeah. than ever. It's just it's news. Yeah. It's something that the Courier Journal got up in Lexington to run with and, and you know, statistics yeah. can be made any way you want them to be made. Right. And for the simple fact that you're looking at a number at the end of the season uh, season ticket holder totals versus five weeks before the season starts season ticket yeah. totals and you're twenty seven percent down. Yeah. Well, you know. I want to see what it was this time last year yeah. uh, and how close are we on track? How far behind are they? Right. Uh, and and they've not, I've not seen that number, and I bet the number's a lot smaller than 27%, yeah. uh, 5% or something maybe. Okay. But Commonwealth, to answer your first part of your question, it's a, it's a really nice experience. Um, you know, there, there's um, the athletics complexes on the back side, and I don't my directions are wrong, but I think it's the n- north side. Um, if I'm looking at it, that's how I'm going to say it's the north side uh, of the stadium, and that's where the football complex is. So there's yeah. no parking there. And then to the just to the left of that is where they do the catwalk, where the, the team okay. comes in. And then a big, huge U, and I mean a giant U that spreads forever, is nothing but tailgating and parking. Okay. Um, so well, see, my uncle, my got uncles and cousins that ever, for the last probably 15 years – the one away game Mississippi State has every other year that they because my uncle lives in Knoxville and they always go to Kentucky because he always talks about it. it's a good stadium to see the game. Yeah, there's not a bad you know, seat. It's not a bad seat. You know, and it it's always six- in October, so sometimes it can get a little bit brisky and the wind can get going to be a little bit chilly, but that it's a it's a pretty place to get into and get out and it's not you know, it's not as cumbersome as a lot of the other places. Yeah, and the, there's there's good traffic routes in and out, um to 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 get to the stadium lots of lots of parking if you want to tailgate and lots of areas to, to tailgate very uh, fan friendly for your tailgating aspects of it and i think what they hold sixty seven thousand or something Some, yeah so i mean it's not small but it's not you know yeah i mean states Tennessee. holds 55 so so we're not the 56. very bottom we're not the top but uh yeah it's a it's a fun place to watch even if you're not a kentucky fan it's a good place to, to go catch a game we might so. need to work on october 6 and maybe see if there's a keeneland slash game we can go to should be I, uh, you know they run them i think they run the whole month of october there and uh you know that's that's such a great double header oh, yeah. ever been able to do that is to to catch the horses run there in the daytime and then you know leave before the last races and go tailgate for a couple hours for a, a late kickoff oh, that'd be awesome um you know that's they used to plan every home game they had in october was was a, a night game uh but you know with the sec scheduling changes what do you keep an eye on that Let's okay. see if we can. Maybe maybe we can broadcast from. Th- we could do a podcast. Yeah. I do a podcast from up there. Uh, get some of your for whom the cowbell tolls, guys. Yeah. Th- if they make the trek up there to do a Tell big come on, do a big massive podcast up there. But uh, yeah, that's that's going to wrap up our our two a days for Mississippi State and the Kentucky Wildcats. So hope you were able to take some good information there, uh, and use that and. And be more informed uh i guess we're at the point of the, the podcast where we have our open mic time and uh, is there anything in particular you want to throw out there for your open mic blair um one thing i do want to make a mention of is um for you historian people um and, I, and this may have kind of gotten by in a little bit of news that came out this week if you're not a mississippi state fan but 
uh, Mississippi State is actually going to play Loyola Chicago in a two-year series in basketball starting this year in at Loyola and then them coming to Mississippi State. And it marks the 50th anniversary of the 1963 um, game of change is what it was dubbed as one of the top five um, historical games in the NCAA. It's where Mississippi State, you know, the, this, this got a Kentucky and State uh, tie really because from 1959 through 1963, Mississippi State won the SEC over Adolph Ruff uh, four out of five years. That was probably their and, only loss every year? And uh, it probably. <laughs> but f- three of the years, Mississippi State was not allowed to go play against black players in the NCAA tournament. So, SC- so the Kentucky actually represented the SEC the three prior years that Mississippi State won the SEC. And um, if you remember back then, it was 32 teams. It's a little bit different than it was today. But um, in 1963, they actually snuck out of town under under a injunction by the by Ross Barnett, the governor of Mississippi, where they would be arrested on the spot under the cover of darkness. Yeah, and uh, and ended up playing against Loyola Chicago. Ended up losing the game, and Loyola Chicago ended up winning a national championship. But it was played at East Lansing and. Kyle Vesey is uh, used to be a beat writer for Mississippi State, and the Clarion Ledger now actually writes for um, the Commercial Appeal in Memphis. Is writing a book that's coming out in November, so it'll kind of tie in to um, this story. But it's a if you're a Mississippi State fan, it's something that you've kind of grown up knowing about. I mean, it's a it's it's basically about guys that said, you know, I don't understand this. And if you could think about the timing, 1963, it wasn't until 1971 that the whole state of Mississippi was segregated and schools were actually changed. And so that's eight years, probably almost a decade before that these guys snuck out of town. You know, under the cover of darkness, like you're talking about, it's pretty amazing that 50 years ago they had to do that. You know, and, right. to and play so, basketball, yeah, to play basketball against guys, and and they had they had basically spent four years prior winning games and never getting a chance to compete in the NCAA tournament, and they just finally said, "This is enough. We're just gonna we're just gonna go." And uh, so it's pretty cool. You know, help me now, Joe Boo. Yeah. <laughs> so it was a pretty cool deal, and so they're gonna be I do it myself. Uh, yeah. Michigan State actually has a plaque at the old Jenison Field House that they played the game. It's one of the historical moments of that old arena. And they were trying to actually work a game where Mississippi State came and played Michigan State in that game to mark a 50th anniversary. And State and Loyola didn't want to do it in that gym. They wanted to kind of do a, a, a rivalry. So I think it was – I think it's really cool. So it's the first time they'll actually play since 50 years ago. So it's a pretty cool event. I think Mississippi State will get – Hopefully, I think ESPN will do it in some nice taste and, and, and get uh, be a nice little positive story on what's going to be probably a very struggling basketball year for Mississippi State. But um, So it should be pretty interesting. But for you that know, just look for that book, and I'll, I'll mention it on the podcast because I think it would be an interesting story, so, so kind of the backstory. Strick- Strickland's background, is he a marketing background? Well, he, actually, you know what he actually – he he he's, he's, he's brilliant when it comes to marketing. He does such a great job down there in Mississippi State. Yeah. I mean, he's on Twitter. He's got good – You know, he's tweets. the second most followed athletic director in the country behind the pizza guy at Michigan. He's the only one that has more followers, which is if you told people that the Mississippi State athletic, athletic director, director that has nothing but a bunch of, you know, toothless Mississippians that don't have any shoes, how they're going to be Twitter. You know, it's like it's kind of funny, but – yeah, he's the second most followed. He's very, very di- – you know, he's got a – he has a um, – um, his background, he actually worked at Kentucky under Mitch Barnhart um, for a time, but he was actually at Baylor um, when the murder went down with the players in basketball, and he was the media relations guy for Baylor. So he was the person that – was the voice of Baylor wow. for 48 straight days that he met with the media and he was the guy. So there's a lot of things that he's kind of gone through through that experience that have kind of um, kind of led him. But the, the, the tie to Mississippi State is Scott Strickland is actually married to the daughter of uh, Bailey Howell, who is the most famous basketball player in Mississippi State history and who's uh, played on the Bill Russell 
Boston Celtics teams and is an actual NBA or actually basketball Hall of Fame. They only have one Hall of Fame, I guess, but they don't have an NBA separate one, but it's just the basketball Hall of Fame. So so he lives back at Starville. So he's pretty uh he's pretty entrenched into the State. the donors of uh Mississippi State, that's for sure. But uh it's a pretty interesting story. But uh on a personal note, we had a fun time yesterday. We uh, did, yes. Um kayaking slash canoeing down the Harpeth River here in Nashville and something we need to do again. Um, but that was a lot of fun. It was hot, but yes. It was a little warm, but uh, it wasn't a bad day. At least we didn't have to worry about rain and the water was clear. And um, I talked to somebody today and they said that they, last time they did that trek from Foggy Bottom, that they actually had to walk their canoe about half the trip because <laughs> the water was low. So I was like, well, I'm glad we didn't have to worry about that. Well, but. I, there were times I had to take <laughs> drag the canoe and it could have been just my inexperience in, yeah. you know, navigating the waters of the Harpeth, but there were definitely some spots there that, it, yeah, it was it, a little low, you know, because it's just a week week away from being up sixteen feet. Yeah, so you know, it went. There's there's a couple of low spots there, yeah. so uh, but it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I was glad we got to do that, and uh, yeah, looking forward to doing that. I'm going to Charleston in a couple of weeks. So I'm looking forward to that. Give see a little PGA Championship. So going to catch what two of the four days is that right three of the four days thursday saturday and sunday on friday going to take the little guy out to the beach and have kind of a charleston day but it's going to be fun looks like they got babysitters lined up for the evenings and we got like 8 30 9 o'clock uh dinner reservations all across charleston so ought to be a lot of fun bring me back some good food yeah i'll eat it don't worry i know you will (laughs) at least the recipes how's that all right um well, I was going to talk about the the tri- trek down the Harpeth as well. So you, you stole my thunder oh, there. Sorry. No, it's that's quite right. It was such a good trip. We we both wanted to talk about it, but uh, it was a lot of fun. It's it's nice to get out, and and that's one thing we're blessed with in in Nashville is so many nice parks and uh, recreational things yeah. to get out and do things here. So we encourage you if you uh, if you don't live in the Nashville area, find somewhere out and get outside and enjoy some nature. Uh, it's it's a a beautiful thing and was put there for a reason for us to enjoy. Yeah. So guys with that, we're going to call this podcast done.